Hey guys, my name is Taylor Olivas. I'm a landscape painter, concept artist, and educator currently working in the games industry. Most recently at Tar Pit Studios with Scott Flanders, as some of you guys might already be familiar with. I would like to share with you some of the shortcuts that I use for my own digital painting process. Coming from a traditional background, I've had to make adjustments in my workflow when it comes to creating evocative images in a digital format, and I found several shortcuts that I use in my own workflow today. I will show how to think simply with basic forms, then compound that to create a convincing image. And I'll be showing you how to do all that on the new Wacom One display tablet. Big thank you to Wacom for sponsoring this video. If you're in the market for a new tablet, Wacom's tablets have always been a favorite of mine. And the Wacom One is great for someone who's just starting their digital game or wants to make art on the go. Now, I remember when I first started digital painting, I always wanted an actual pen display that I can draw on, but unfortunately, the price always exceeded my budget. Nowadays, the entry price has gone down significantly, making these displays much more appealing. It has also been a win-win considering that I technically have another display that I can throw a reference, Twitch stream, or any other software I may need to use for work. Now, I think it's important to consider that the tool is only gonna be working as good as the person using it. In all, having good fundamental skills should allow you to thrive regardless of the media you choose. Richard Smith, in his book All a Prima, once said that if Michelangelo had only been equipped with a broom and a bucket of mud, the Sistine Chapel would still have been the masterpiece that it is today. Frazetta has also been known to use cheap Mickey Mouse watercolor sets. However, it is easier to paint the Sistine Chapel or Barbarians with a proper brush and paints. Alright, so let's dive into it. Again, I understand some of the frustrations that come with creating a painting from scratch, especially in a digital format like Photoshop. Some of the first pieces of artwork that I've actually made have been through acrylic, watercolors, oils, and charcoals. So finding a way to transition into this new medium took several years. But hopefully the simple steps will help to make you a little bit more comfortable in this workspace. Personally, I hate dealing with tons of menus in my workspace because ultimately these are just going to impede my ability to create. If you're completely new to Photoshop, and you're using the Wacom One, this is what your user interface will look like when you first start up Photoshop. When I paint, I only navigate through certain panels, so I'll show you how I set up mine. Let's get rid of some of this unnecessary bloat inside of Photoshop. Right now we're in the Essentials workspace, so this is gonna give us all of these different panels that we're probably never ever gonna use. So what you're gonna wanna do is just create a new workspace here and rename this. Hit save, and then from here, I'm gonna drag out my color cube and I'll delete all these other panels. So I'm gonna close these tab groups, layers I'm gonna need. Let's close these. All right, so now we've slimmed down a little bit. All I need to do is dock the layers over here to the left side. When that highlights blue, then that'll take up the whole column here. And I'll throw my color over here. So the one thing we're missing is our brushes. To find that or any other panel, you go up here to window and I'm going to locate my brushes right here. So I don't need my brush settings, it'll come with that. And let me just dock this down here. Now my workspace is ready to go and I can always switch between different workspaces if I need to. Now that we've got a workspace that's comfortable for us to work in, I'd like to overview some of the tools that I use. A lot of my process revolves around me finding ways to create strong graphic shapes from the very start. And one of the fastest ways I've found to do that is by not actually painting in the shapes with a brush, but using different selection tools inside of Photoshop. So those are mainly gonna be my lasso tool, the regular one, the polygonal lasso tool, the rectangular marquee tool, and the elliptical marquee tool. So you can see how quickly I'm able to switch between all of these, and that's because I have my keyboard shortcuts stacked on one another. And if you look here, you can see that I have A set to my marquee tools, and T set to my polygonal lasso tools. The reason why I have these set to T and A is because they're very close to where my hand rests on the keyboard. I like to think that a lot of the keyboard shortcuts we're using are similar to like the shortcuts you use if you play like computer games, for example. So if you can have like all these keyboard shortcuts closer to your hand, then it's gonna be a lot easier for you to access them. If you're left-handed, it might be a little bit different, but I would suggest to make your own keyboard shortcuts that are gonna be allowing you to work comfortably. So here I'm able to create selections and cut away at these shapes if I want to. 
and I can even cut away at these lasso selections too. So if I wanted to add pieces to this concept, for example, I can create really strong graphic shapes this way and use this as a way to paint. So also another tool I use a lot too is this move canvas. So I can move the canvas around super easy and that's just gonna be your space bar. Another great one I use too is if I'm creating selections here. So I'm just gonna create a sphere really quick. With this sphere here, I can move this around really easily. And the keyboard shortcut I use for this is gonna be V. One of the cool things is, is if you have multiple layers, for instance, if you're trying to select these different layers, you can go to auto select here. And what that'll do is when you click on those pixels, it'll take you to that layer with those respective pixels on them. So this is like a lot easier to move around certain elements in your painting if you really need to. Now there's also transform tools inside of Photoshop that I use pretty frequently as well. For example, if we wanted to create that sphere shape, but we wanted to manipulate it a little bit. So I have my, my transform tools on right now and I can use Alt to change these shapes can use control to change just one of these vertices to skew my object. Or I can use a combination of both. And I can use shift too. So I won't go too in depth with this, but I would really suggest that you guys experiment with this and see what type of results you can get. So this is really good when you need to create patterns and overlay them on certain planes, or if you need to skew them later on. This is one of the transform tools that I use quite often. Since this might be a new process for some of you, I'm going to show how we can just combine some of our shortcuts together to create a convincing sphere. So I'm using my selection tools to just create a basic circle, and I'm using a clipping mask on top of this. And what this is going to do is it's going to make sure that any of the pixels I paint on the top layer, they're going to adhere to the shapes on the bottom. So you can see I have like the cursor of that brush that's going on the outside of the shape. The brush strokes are actually confined within the shape of that circle. Now I'm compounding this a little bit more. I'm using a mask on top of this to work non-destructively. This is just eliminating what's on top of the mask a little bit to reveal what's underneath. And I'm always making sure that I'm separating both my lights and my shadows and working in between both of those different layers. Again, I'm using this transform tool and I'm pretty much just stealing the shape of the sphere to make a cast shadow here. And again, I'm using these clipping masks to create an ambient occlusion layer and you'll see I'll go back and forth between these layers and by keeping everything separate I'm able to go back and make some iterations and this helps a lot when you get into like a large concept where you have a lot of different subject matter it's going to be easier to manage things and if you just practice this process of working non-destructively it's going to make your your painting a lot easier in the future so here I'm able to move some of the groups around and everything is going to be working on its own layer. So there's honestly so many different ways that you can describe light and dark. And by doing so, you can describe different types of forms, especially once you get into textures. I think it's fun to look at some of the old masters and see how a lot of them use texture and edge to create different types of forms. And eventually you'll get to a point where you're using textural brushes to create like a shorthand for some types of objects that exist in nature. So I'm using some of my own brushes that I've been experimenting with. A lot of them come from actual traditional scans from my own paintings. A lot of them give me a bunch of chaos to kind of work in. And if you think about like happy accidents, this is kind of where this starts to occur. In the back of my mind, I'm really thinking about, you know, how can I use these types of textures to describe different things in nature? And this could be like rocks, it could be clouds. It could be skin, it could be freckles. So I'm thinking about different ways of using these brushes in the future. And you'll see in the painting in the future, I'm gonna show a little bit about how these brushes can be applied. I would definitely try this out for yourself though and see how far you can take your brushes. Now we can apply some of what we learned with just creating a basic sphere in Photoshop into an actual environment painting. I'll be using a reference that I actually took myself. The point of this is to create something that's a little bit more exaggerated. Maybe I can find like the essence of being there at that place at that certain time. Hopefully I can infuse something from that moment of time into this piece that the photograph just didn't capture. 
I'm starting off with just like some very gestural movements. I like to think about just like abstract composition, like how can we create an image that is somewhat balanced but also simple. And here I'm diving into like a little bit more of a complex sketch to give myself just like a roadmap, like where do I go, like where are my shapes going to be. And you can see there I'm using some of my crop tools to create a sense of perspective there, kind of warp things off into the background as if they were going off into a vanishing point. So you can see I'm still sticking to that process of painting that sphere. I'm creating big masses of shape at this point and I'm making sure that I have like a silhouette that's good and convincing. You know, it's not too hard to convince the viewer that, you know, these are rock shapes. Just studying some of like the negative shape relationships, how things are spaced apart from one another is just something that you might want to look at, observe and then apply. So like I said, there's like so many different ways of working inside of Photoshop. I'm using a levels adjustment right now. And what this is doing is it's working on top of the values I have underneath. And this is just creating a different value key. It's pretty much shifting the tones and the values underneath. And it's working in tandem with the mask to make sure that I can come back and forth if I want to. I can just use that mask to paint on top of instead of having to paint directly on top of the layer. Gives me a chance to iterate if I need to in the future. So sometimes when I'm painting, like especially if I'm just having fun improvising from a photograph, like I'll, I'll get carried away and I'll start getting into like the nuanced areas like here, I'll start to create smaller shapes, which is not necessarily what you really want to do. But overall, I got just a, a decent read where I have like a light and a dark relationship going on right now and my light's kind of coming from the back. It's like a backlit scene right now. So those planes on the top really aren't getting too much light. There's just small hints of that light that's gonna be kind of casting over the form. And you can see even the boulders in the foreground that I'm establishing right now kind of have that same relationship. I'm creating larger shapes in the foreground and I'm making sure that they get a little bit smaller as they go back in the distance. Those overlapping shapes of light and dark kind of help to give a sense of perspective too. I like to think about massing like lights and darks together as like some sort of tapestry. Like if you can think about how fabric is held together, it's like kind of woven together. And if you maintain your lights and darks in the same way, then your composition is going to be a little bit stronger. Things are going to hold together a little bit more. The fabric of your overall composition is going to hold. James Gurney actually describes it really well too. Talks about it as being shape welding. I think that's the term he uses, is shape welding. And it's really interesting because you can really create strong compositions if you make sure that all your shapes are kind of meshing together, especially if the relationships of light and dark are working well. Now that I've got like all my lights and darks in place in my composition, at least a simple composition is working from a thumbnail point of view, I'm just throwing in some color trying to establish a little bit of cool atmosphere for the sky and throwing in some warms for these rocks too, trying to establish some sort of light color for those. And I'll work back into the shadows too. You can see I'm using the selection of the mask I use for the levels and I'm creating another shadow layer on top of that, but directly painting on top of it. Making sure to use all of the different selections I've created in Photoshop, going back and forth and reusing things. So just to describe kind of what I'm using for the colors, I'm using complementary colors of like purples and yellows. And within that, I'm getting a little bit more nuance, like color breakup. I'm just playing around with some of the, some of the grays that exist within those color groupings. And that's giving me just a little bit of interest. Now, even though I've introduced a lot of color at this point, you can see that my overall light and dark composition hasn't really changed at all. My values really haven't changed in terms of their overall structure. And that's one thing to keep in mind. You want to make sure that your thumbnail is somewhat similar to your final painting. You want to make sure that those shapes are somewhat consistent. You always have a little bit of room to, to play around and mesh objects together or break things apart. But for the most part, you want to stay true to that initial statement that you made in the very beginning. 
This is where things start to get a little bit more chaotic, where I'm directly painting over some of these layers and breaking away from that non-destructive method of working. But I'm still thinking about what each layer is doing for me, and knowing that I can go back and affect these layers is really going to be super helpful. And now like that sphere, like for the second demo of the sphere, you can see I'm using those textural elements to create a sense of material for these rocks. You can see where, where the Terminator exists, I have a lot of texture between light and dark. That's helping to convey that that's a rock. By creating more overlap, it's helping to reinforce that perspective a little bit more too. With those rocks in the background getting hit with light, it's helping to show that things are going off in the distance as they get smaller. It tricks our eye into believing that we have a lot more structural perspective than we do. This is a very impressionistic approach to digital painting as well. At this point, I'm, I'm really experimenting with my brushes. This is the point where I had just imported my brushes and some of them were pretty wacky. I'm trying to find different ways of using them. Like I'm even rotating my canvas upside down to, to help me get that angle where the brush is actually gradating the way I want it to. And these are notes I make for myself too on how to, how to improve my brushes and how can I actually use them for, for certain types of textures. You can probably tell I'm at a point in the painting where I'm, I'm still trying to figure out what are the main decisions that I'm going to be making? Like, what are, what are the biggest strokes that I should be making at this point? And should I have most of the detail in my shadows? Or should I have most of the detail in my lights? So one thing to consider too is like, our eye usually exposes for darks or for lights. And if we can prioritize one of those, then that's going to make our paintings a little bit more effective and believable too. There's a couple of areas in this painting where I'll go back, like especially where the lights meet the darks, I'll create a little bit more contrast in the darks. And what that's gonna do is it's just gonna exaggerate that form as the core shadow and the terminator is, is moving the light across into the shadows. Again, just playing around with some of these brushes, like I really treat these like little experiments. Like if I'm going out and planar painting or landscape painting for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's just a fun way to kind of relax and vibe out and find different pathways of creating paintings. Like, this is where you're just going to be making mistakes and kind of pushing around the paint, seeing what happens, rolling with things. If you create a certain shape and riffing off of it, a little like improv. These are some brushes I downloaded from the internet. I think they're Jamie Jones brushes, but in this brush pack, he's got a bunch of different crazy textures that can be used for like foliage or birds, clouds, and really specific pieces in the environment. And they help to save a little bit of time instead of having to draw that shape completely with a round brush. It's easier just to imply it. Getting to the point where my composition, I'm, I'm somewhat enjoying it. Like I feel pretty okay about it now. I'm refining some of those areas that push that believability a little bit, that representationalism where we get a little bit more nuance in our core shadows and inside our shadows, making sure that we have some reflected light, our core shadows are working properly, and some of the smaller shapes are being accounted for too. So ever since getting the Cintiq, it's actually been so much easier to create these lasso selections and be a little bit more precise with them. That's like one thing I've noticed about using this tablet is it feels a little bit more organic using these brush strokes, you feel like you have a, a direct response towards your painting. You get like direct feedback where the Intuos, which I've used for, for a long time, it's been really nice. You get this weird disconnect because your hand is down and your eyes are up. I feel like it could use a little bit more movement with some lighter shapes that were kind of leading us through the painting. So we have like some sort of rhythm with the silhouetted shapes of the rocks in the background with the rocks in the foreground coming into the light. And I want us to come into the foreground and go into the background. I want that to be a part of the gestural impact of the image. I'm using a couple of other layer adjustments here, like a black and white, and also a levels to overexpose some of these areas, maybe push some of the brights a little bit more. Now that this sketch is somewhat complete, I'm going back and just retouching some areas and also adding in a couple of birds too. 
it helps to have a little bit of ambient wildlife in the background of your painting to give it a sense of life, to show that there are things that live here and it's not just a barren wasteland. I really hope that watching my process and seeing how I'm not super critical of the drawing I have, I'm kind of just vibing with the shapes I've, I've got and the reference that I'm using and definitely relying on some of my past experience with plein air painting using my visual vocabulary to draw up some of those colors I've seen in the past and in real life. I really hope this gives you a, a new perspective on digital painting and how you can approach it a little bit, a little bit more freely. So that's it. I hope this has given you that extra little boost you needed to jump into digital painting. If you want to see more of my work, check out my Instagram and my art station. And if you're interested in a personal mentorship, go to the link below and shoot me a message. I teach at Laguna College of Art and Design and really enjoy helping my students grow and push themselves to their next level and would be happy to help you out too. See you all next time. Thank you, Taylor. And special thanks to Wacom for sponsoring this video. The holidays are about to emerge. Be generous and treat yourself to a gift. Wacom's most affordable display tablet yet, the Wacom One with its 13-inch HD screen, paper-like canvas, and portable size. You'll be able to art anywhere. Find your gift in our links below and start painting with the best line of tablets on the market. And thank you, Taylor.